smiling faces um, to talk about a horrible subject. So, um, but I want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation and for uh, putting us up in a wonderful place and, and hosting us uh, so excellently uh, throughout the weekend. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors of uh, this particular talk. So B Culture is the sponsor of this talk. I want to um, thank them for their support. They have a really excellent booth downstairs to so make sure that you uh, um, go down to the venue and uh, make use of all of it. I also want to echo uh, Sue's comments earlier about how impressive this honey show is. So kudos to all of you um, who entered. Uh, I mean, you have more mead categories than we have <laughs> in all of our, you know, our state fair categories. It's just, uh, just really impressive and it's just great to see. Um, so again, thank, thank you very much. Um, the, the topic here that I was asked to talk about was um, colony collapse disorder from an American perspective. Um, and so I'm going to be very true to that title, that I'm only really going to be talking about colony collapse disorder, sensu stricto, and from the American perspective, okay? Um, and that's because, as we will you know, learn through our discussion here for the next uh, few minutes, that um, the media has tended to portray colony collapse disorder as everything d bad dealing with bees, right? Is that the same over here, or is that just an American thing? Same thing, drives me crazy. Um, so what I'd really like to do is really kind of focus on that, the, the you know, the sensu stricto issue of CCD um, realizing that this can be convoluted with all issues dealing with bee health, and so trying to, to make that distinction. It's been a struggle, I think, for, for all of us. Um, so, of course, we all know uh, the importance of bees um, and all of your wonderful honey that you have downstairs. I didn't see a single bear, so um, very disappointed. Uh, all the same jars. Uh, no. um, but, of course, uh, we all know us as beekeepers, um, and, and in some ways a silver lining about CCD and all the media attention is that it really has brought to light the true importance of bees, and, and honeybees in particular, is, is the importance of pollination, right? I think when I first started my job at, at, in North Carolina, I used to have to justify why I had a job. Um, you know, well, honey isn't all that important. You know, why do we have a professor about honey? And I'm like, well, it's not about honey, it's about pollination. And so if there's one thing that has educated the public about the importance of bees has been this topic of, of CCD. And so in that way, it's been, you know, a real blessing in, in some ways um, to justify the importance of bees and, and, you know, why we do what we do. Now, um, what is perhaps different from the pollination use of honeybees in North America versus here is that we tend to have much larger scale commercial operations that provide this pollination service for greater commercial production agriculture. Um, we have about 2.6 million beehives in the US and 90% of them are owned by about five to ten percent of the beekeepers, um, and those that small number of beekeepers, relatively small number of beekeepers, owning the vast majority of beehives, they do so uh, like this. So they have thousands or even tens of thousands of colonies that they manage with large crews, um, and they move those bees in and out of the orchards and crops. Uh, under contract with the growers of those crops, um, providing that pollination service. And so every year there's this migratory movement of beehives in the U.S. where most, not all, but most of the commercial beekeepers overwinter their colonies in the more favorable southern climate of the U.S. Um, so that they can build up more quickly and earlier in the season than they would if they overwintered up north. And then upon doing so, upon contracts, they then move their colonies um, all over the map, quite literally, 
um, providing those pollination services to where, wherever they're contracted. Now, one of the largest um, demands for these many beehives in the US is um, out in California in February and March timeframe with the almonds. So of the 2.6 or so million beehives, it's one and a half million, more, something like that, that migrate out to California to pollinate this one crop of almonds. And that's because almonds are 100% dependent on honeybee pollination. And the entire industry, two billion plus dollar industry every single year, that is inherently reliant on honeybee pollination. And so the um, demands that that one single um, sector of the agricultural economy has on, on bees is quite astounding. And so, you know, bees from the East Coast, West Coast, everywhere else goes out to California. Once the almond pollination is done, then they disperse back. Um, and then as spring kind of springs, as, they, um, as, as, as it goes further north, and a lot of the migratory beekeepers go to different crops further and further north as those different crops are in bloom, and then at the end of the summer, they all return back to the southern third to start all over again. So there's this migratory nature of most of the beehives in the U.S. that is quite different from what you guys are, are uh, traditionally dealing with. Now, as you uh, all are keenly aware, and I, I'm totally aware of this, but in the U.S., we uh, kind of recapitulate this as well, that there's been many, many different problems in apiculture in the honeybee population. So at the end of World War II, there was something close to six million beehives in the United States. But as I said, currently we're down to about 2.6 or so. And this has been a slow, steady decline over time um, as there have been changes in demographics, as there's been consolidation in agriculture where there used to be you know, small family farms where every single farm had a hive or two of bees behind the barn. Uh, but with the consolidation of agriculture, there's also been a consolidation of apiculture. Um, and so there's been fewer and fewer beekeepers and fewer and fewer beehives. Um, here in the 1980s, you see this very marked and steep decline. Anybody take a gander as to what caused that? It was when Varroa came in, but actually that was Ronald Reagan who changed the, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Um, he changed the manner by which these statistics were taken uh, so that if you, um, you used to, if you had any beehives, you had to fill out the form. But in the 1980s, in order to save money, um, if you had fewer than five beehives, you didn't have to fill it out anymore. So that's what that drop is, actually. We, we can still blame Varroa, that's fine. Um, <laughs> it was concurrent. But, but regardless, over the, the long term, over the last several generations, there's been this slow and steady trickle. And this is, of course, prompted by Varroa, by Nosema, by small hive beetles, uh, by pesticides, by viruses, all of these different things that, again, we, we're all familiar with and, and um, each one deserves its own its own presentation, but in, its congreg in the congregate, it's uh, been really problematic for bees and beekeeping, um, and I don't have to tell anybody in this room uh, anything about that. But again, this uh, topic is really about colony collapse disorder in the strict sense, not the combination of all of these different things. Um, and what you might not realize is that we in North Carolina have the one and only proven uh, picture of colony collapse disorder um, as it's occurring. And so this is colony collapse disorder. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most definitive proof that we have of colony collapse disorder um, following a hurricane. We get a lot of hurricanes down in North Carolina. So, um, so there's actually two forms of colony collapse disorder, this kind, um, and the one that, that uh, we really um, you know, attribute to this kind of mysterious syndrome that, that is now kind of infamous. And as the story goes, whether this is true or not is up to you to believe, but the, um, the story of how colony collapse disorder was really described starts uh, this, with this gentleman here. This is one of those large scale commercial beekeepers in the United States based in Florida and Pennsylvania, depending on whether it's winter or summer. And his name is David Hackenberg. And as luck would have it, um, his Pennsylvania operation up in the north 
is uh, the same hometown that I grew up in. And so he and his son and me went to high school together. This was years before I ever got into bees, but that's um, just random trivia. Uh, but Dave Hackenberg, um, uh, as the story goes, he had several holding yards down in, in Florida um, during the early spring. And uh, he went to them and he was managing them and he went to them one week and they all looked great. They're all healthy and thriving and, and doing just great. And then two weeks later, he goes back in order to move them for one of these pollination contracts. And he comes back and he sees this, just a ghost town. Just empty hives, um, you know, uh, not really a lot of dead bees, but just kind of, they just seemingly disappeared. And he started making all sorts of phone calls and he was talking to scientists and regulatory authorities and everybody was kind of, oh, well, you just have a mite problem or you, they're just starved to death. And they were all attributing this phenomenon to the same old, same old, right? These are all the things that, that we've been dealing with. But, oh, and these are just some pictures of, of kind of what he found. And, and he knew that there was something different. You know, Dave, Dave is a very experienced, you know, uh, well-respected beekeeper. And he knew that this was something that was very, it, it, the onset of it was very rapid because not only had he been there two weeks prior and they were healthy and thriving, um, going into the colonies, he saw just this depopulation of the adult bees, but huge amounts of brood for the most part. Now, of course, who is there to raise that brood? Somebody had to be there to raise all of that brood, but if the adults aren't there, then something doesn't fit. The classic symptoms of varroa, you know, uh, parasitic mite syndrome and these other things, it's much slower. It, it happens much where it kind of slowly happens, whereas this seemed to happen very, very rapidly. Um, and so he knew something was, was off and something was different. And it wasn't until he talked to this gentleman here who at the time was the apiary inspector in Pennsylvania, uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp. And uh, Dennis, I think, had the, the, the remarkable and keen insight to rather than just kind of blame the usual suspects to really see, okay, there really probably is something different that's going on here. And in conversation with Dave and then others who also were kind of experiencing some of these same phenomenon, came up with this list of, of symptoms that described this uh, syndrome. And that was that the adult population just seemingly uh, uh, goes away very, very rapidly because there's still a lot of brood and food present, so they're not starving to death. Um, if there are any bees that remain within the colony, it's all of those bees that can't fly. Namely the queen, so we know that they didn't abscond, and any of those newly emerged callow bees that are, you know, hard enough and, and they're not mature enough yet to fly. Um, and one last uh, symptom is that if you put a, 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 you know, an empty super of honey out in the middle of your apiary, what's going to happen? all the other bees are gonna start robbing it like crazy, right? Well, that wasn't happening in these instances. So there's very little evidence of, of robbing, of uh, wax moths, of small high beetles, and some of these other pests. And so that was another kind of um, symptom of this, uh, of this issue. And so um, this was a phenomenon then that um, Dennis uh, got together a whole team of scientists very early on known as the CCD Working Group, um, and was trying to look at it from all these different angles and uh, bringing together um, different expertise uh, uh, and different techniques that, that people would use. And so uh, this, sim this syndrome, very early on, we were originally calling it fall dwindle disease because this was happening in the fall, in the autumn, and it was you know the, where the colonies were dwindling very, very rapidly. Um, but very early on, we realized, well, this may very well might not be happening only in the fall. The bees aren't really dwindling. It's kind of a very rapid depopulation. We have no idea if it's a disease or not. And so this working group then very quickly came colony collapse disorder rather than this fall dwindle disease because it was um, more descriptive and more appropriate for what we were seeing with the information that we had at the time. So that report um, and, I swear, Dave Hackenberg's mugshot 
in the, in the popular press really snowballed and took off. He was the perfect poster child, I think, for this, uh, this whole phenomenon. And it, it really snowballed. And so there was a lot of media attention where there was just, you know, article after article after article about this kind of mysterious syndrome. And I think it was just a very compelling story for the media to talk about this mysterious threat and the bees are disappearing. And it was just kind of this perfect storm um, that just captured the intention uh, about 10 years ago. Now, because of that, as I was alluding to earlier, the media then portrayed all problems to CCD. And this is never something that any of the scientists have espoused um, and always trying to make the distinction between CCD in the strict sense and all B problems in general. And so um, I use this figure here to kind of illustrate that. If we have 2.6 million beehives in the United States, um, surveys have really shown that pr fairly consistently about a third of those colonies are lost every single winter. So there is a pretty significant mortality, which again is very problematic. Um, so a third of the bees in the United States die off every single winter. Um, about a quarter of those <coughs> die off for reasons that don't seem to be explained. That is to say, 75% of the mortality every single winter um, are blaming the usual suspects of starvation, varroa mites, you know, a lot of these other kind of problems. So only about a quarter of those losses are attributed to unknown or suspect causes. And only about a tenth of those are consistent with those symptoms that I was talking about of CCD. So if you do the calculus here, you know, a vanishingly small minority of the bee population is subject to colony collapse disorder in the strict sense. But again, the media makes it sound like all the bees are dead and they've all died of CCD, right? And that's never been the case. Uh, and, and that's never anything that anybody said, but it just kind of makes the, it's the, the general narrative that seems um, to be fairly pervasive. So I'm just going to be talking about those cases, not kind of all mortality here. Okay, um, the CCD working group at the time had the mantra that um, all hypotheses were on the table. However, many of them were not actively being investigated, all right? So first and foremost, um, that whole media blitz about the cell phones, do you guys remember this? <laughs> cell phones were killing off our bees and, and causing, uh, the, I can go into a story, but I know uh, I stand between you and lunch, so I'm not gonna give you the whole, uh, the whole breakdown, but it really doesn't make sense that cell phones would be causing CCD anyway, right? Because if that were true, then honeybees would only be pollinating blackberries, right? <laughs> or, or apples, I guess, you know, bla blackberry went out of business, right? So now we have to say apples with the iPhone, it doesn't really work as well, so. Um, that joke is pretty soon going to be lost to time. But reg regardless, um, you know, none of these were really, like, divine rapture was my favorite, that all the bees disappeared to be with Jesus in heaven. Um, very popular down in the south. Um, Osama bin Laden, right? We can rule that one out. Um, Another one, and this was serious, somebody pieced together the fact that Russian honeybees were imported into the U.S. and that Putin was trying to bring back the Soviet Union by poisoning our food supply. Okay, so old commie, you know, uh, um, terrorist plot. But anyway, I mean, there, there were lots and lots. So this is the thing. In the absence of good empirical objective information, speculation can run rampant, right? And there was a lot of that at the time. Um, and so these just kind of illustrate that. But I think um, at the time and over time, we've really focused on three main areas that um, have the highest likelihood to be explanatory mechanisms behind colony collapse disorder in the strict sense. The first is nutritional stress. Um, this is something that, again, all of you are keenly aware of that if the bees do not have adequate nectar and pollen sources, 
that makes everything else that they're dealing with all the more difficult. They, their immune systems may not be up to snuff. They just aren't able to make the brood as healthy as they can. They're not able to store away that honey. They're not able to make their winter stores, which makes winter mortality all the more challenging. So nutritional stress, what they're eating and how much they're eating, habitat loss, you know, uh, urbanization, um, the ditch to ditch farming techniques that we have where we don't have nearly the, you know, the number of weeds, right? To, to the farmer, weeds are bad. To the beekeeper, weeds are good or they can be, right? So a lot of these things are, are interplaying with bee health uh, through the nutrition that the bees have. The second area, of course, is environmental contamination, most notably pesticides and the different um, you know, chemicals that the bees are being exposed to out uh, at, uh, on their foraging trips. Because you know, bees can fly, honeybees can fly you know, four miles away, which is about 50 square miles. I don't know, what is that in kilometers? I don't know. I, I realize you guys don't know miles anymore, even though you invented it. Uh, oh, you do? OK, good. All right, 50 square miles. 50 square miles is a lot of real estate, right? That's a lot of real estate. And they're, they're central place foragers, so they go out in the environment, they're picking up their food, and they're coming back so they can be sequestering these different compounds from their environment inside the hive. Um, and those things can be building up inside the hive matrices, the honey and the wax and the comb. And you know, that can be causing real problems. And so there's been a lot of research looking into pesticides in particular, but environmental contaminants in general. And there's also the, the things that the beekeepers themselves in the US are very famous for placing inside their colonies for mite control and other, other, um, other needs. The third area is pathology. So lots of different disease agents um, are at work, right? And again, Sue already mentioned some of them. You're all abundantly aware of you know, most of them. These are things that we're dealing with constantly as, as a beekeeping community looking at the different pathologies, both the known ones, viruses, nosema, varroa, as well as the unknown ones, right? There may be um, uh, disease agents out there that we don't yet know about uh, as scientists and as a, as a beekeeping community. So we need to be on the lookout for new things as well as the old things or things that have changed with respect to you know, different viral vir uh, uh, variants and, and these other types of things. So the, these are all very complex issues and all three of these things interact with each other. And I think that that's the conventional wisdom is that it's this multiplicative um, problem that's a combination of uh, more than one of these general factors. So at the time, again, I'm sticking to the story of this original CCD working group um, and at the time when this was the first advent and um, kind of description of colony collapse disorder, there were two major, major studies that were undertaken on that, that over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of science that has come from them, from this first year. Um, the, the first study was kind of a large scale, single sampling event. So uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp and Jeff, Jeff Pettis and, and many others um, went out to lots of different beekeepers um, in, uh, in across you know, many different places in the US and sampled comb, bees, brood, uh, bee bread, um, lots of different, um, just taking samples and throw them in the freezer. And then those samples were then dispersed among the, the different members of this working team in order to analyze them in different ways. Uh, so this was kind of a, a large scale, single kind of time cross section, a single event, trying to, to sample colonies that supposedly succumbed to colony collapse disorder, and then healthy colonies that were sitting right next to them that uh, did not come down with colony collapse disorder. So we had healthy and sick populations that were kind of collected at the same time at the same place, trying to identify one or more things that was in the CCD bees but absent in the healthy bees, and that would give us, you know, kind of a smoking gun, as you were, to, to go out and investigate that mechanism further. The second major study was kind of a, a, the opposite of this one-time cross-section, 
It was a longitudinal study. So it was um, following three of these large-scale commercial beekeepers over an entire year. So it was uh, following the same colonies and taking repeated samples over the whole year um, as they move from one place to another. And so this uh, diagram right here, even though you can't read it, but it's showing operations one, two, three, and the different sampling events uh, of the different stars here, and then where they were um, moved to. And so every single one of these colonies was sampled before and after the move as they kind of repeatedly moved those same hives throughout the same year, throughout that year. So again, longitudinal study rather than a single uh, cross section. And so, you know, a there were a lot of things that were done at that time. Uh, one of the things was, well, is, you know, the, the hives and the combs that uh, had a colony died from CCD, was there uh, some sort of infectious agent or some, you know, problem with the hives itself um, that could then be transferred to another colony? So if you just shook a package or put a new colony inside that same hive, would that colony also succumb to CCD, right? Um, and so they would, there was a study that was very quickly done uh, by Dennis and Jeff looking at um, the reuse of those combs. And the long and the short of it is, is that following their, uh, the mortality over time with those uh, four different um, treatment groups, the take home message is that there didn't seem to be any appreciable um, increased mortality risk of colonies that were placed into, into hives that succumbed to CCD versus those that were not. So there didn't seem to be kind of a, a residue or a historical problem that subsequent colonies were inheriting from colonies that died off from CCD. Um, there were, as I said, these, these uh, single cross-section samples dispersed to all of these different labs across the U.S. and they did their analyses and came back together. And um, across all the different labs, there were 61 different variables that were measured of the CCD colonies and the healthy colonies and compared all 61 of these uh, between those two populations, looking at the adult bees, pathogens, pesticides, all sorts of things. And in general, in essence, we couldn't find one single factor that was highlighted uh, between the two. So there was nothing that was persistently or consistently in the CCD colonies, but absent in the healthy colonies or vice versa. So there, there didn't seem to be a single smoking gun that uh, really kind of uh, um, prompted further research to say, ah, this is the one thing that seems to be causing this. And so very early on, based on this study here, uh, it seemed that there was a combination of different factors that led to this particular syndrome. There wasn't going to be an easy explanation. Um, soon thereafter, in uh, 2007, there was a science paper that was giving some hints at perhaps one factor that may be fairly discriminatory. And that was this um, relatively, at the time, relatively new virus known as the Israeli acute paralysis virus, or IAPV. Um, and this was something that, again, was not perfectly diagnostic, but seemed to be much more associated with colonies that had collapsed versus colonies that were healthy. Um, and so this uh, was then regaled by the media as, well, this is the solution to CCD. We don't have to write about this anymore, right? So this is the first of three times that the media had <coughs> tried to tie a, a bow on this particular story of colony collapse disorder. Um, subsequent studies, I should say, have kind of replicated and repeated this and did not find the same association. So while in the beginning, IEPV seemed to be a very good candidate for a potential cause behind colony collapse disorder, um, I don't think that, that it's nearly that simple and IEPV is now um, not uh, viewed as the, the leading culprit or reason behind the phenomenon. 
Uh, there was also another study that was looking at all the different hive matrices of all the different pesticides that were found in the bees, in the bee bread, and it, particularly in the wax. And that's what's shown here, uh, I believe, in, in this figure here. So this was something that was a huge eye-opener, I think, for a lot of people, looking at just how many different pesticides were being sequestered inside the beehives in the United States. Um, not only the number, I think on average it was something like seven different pesticides on average were found in, in, in any given uh, hive, but it could range upwards into the 20s. Um, and the, the levels of them varied tremendously, the types of pesticides varied tremendously, but there were several take-home messages from this particular study. One is that there were two pesticides that were nearly ubiquitously found in managed commercial beehives. Those two are cumaphos and fluvalinate. These are two acaricides that beekeepers themselves were placing into the hives to control varroa mites. Um, so that was nearly ubiquitous. Um, but there were many others, um, fungicides uh, primarily, fungicides, some herbicides, and, and some insecticides that were found at very, very high uh, rates and high prevalences. And again, because in the US, fungicides are relatively non-toxic to honeybees, and a lot of the, uh, the um, fungus pathogens of a lot of crops occur on the blossoms of the, the, the crop. And so the growers are often spraying fungicides during bloom when the bees are there pollinating them. So you see a lot of those, uh, those chemicals in, in hive matrices because of that. Um, so there was a, a lot of um, uh, insights that this study provided looking at the different <laughs> environmental contaminants that are found inside the, the beehives. But again, no single chemical was found in colonies that died of CCD versus the healthy ones. That there didn't seem to be a single kind of smoking gun as far as a different pesticide that could be an underlying cause of the phenomenon. Uh, later on, there was a, a genomic approach um, that was taken by looking at, at the different gene expression of colonies of bees from colonies that died from CCD versus not. Um, and this is just really harnessing the power of a lot of these new genetic techniques um, that are really insightful, looking at a gene-by-gene -gene basis and whether it's getting turned on or off as a result of different conditions. In this case, whether they died from CCD or not. Um, and so overall, there was an elevated expression of different uh, kind of pesticide detoxification genes and enzymes. So that's, that's highly suggestive, obviously. Um, but there didn't seem to be, you know, any one clear signal that was occurring here. Um, but in essence, one of the, the biggest take-home messages here is that their um, antiviral and their immune systems of colonies that died of CCD, they were really jacked up. Uh, so those genes were, were highly expressed and turned on much more. Um, but again, there wasn't kind of a clear signal and evidence here of one factor over another, but it just seemed to be, to be indicating that colonies that died of CCD were more stressed out, which is kind of no duh, right? Because uh, they died. The second time that the media regaled the pronouncement that solution to CCD was, was discovered and found was upon the publication of this paper by uh, another group, not the CCD working group, um, or um, studies derived from those samplings. But it was um, associating two different pathogens, uh, a relatively uh, unknown and newly described aritavirus, a DNA-based virus, and our good old friend Nosema serrana. Uh, the microsporidian that lives in the guts of the bees. And uh, this paper uh, made a big splash at the time and uh, was based, you know, on these cage studies done in uh, kind of petri dishes looking at how the dual infection of, of this virus and this fungus caused um, an increased mortality 
in the bees in the cages um, compared to when they're uh, not fed those different pathogens. Um, now, subsequent studies, however, have been unable to find that aridivirus in managed colonies. So there's some debate as to what this kind of new found virus is and whether it's really prevalent in um, uh, a lot of these colonies that are, that are actively managed in, in North America. And so nobody's really been able to follow up on this new DNA virus and, and whether it's, um, it's really prevalent or really causing problems among, among the bees. And even that, uh, that group that, that studied that is, is no longer pursuing this line of research. So we're kind of at a question as to the relevance of that aridivirus at this point. There were, however, kind of more, rather than focusing on any one individual pathogen, taking a more comprehensive look and looking at strong colonies versus weak colonies or collapsed colonies for the entire pathogen web. So looking at all the different diseases and disease agents at the same time. And so, again, there's no one pathogen that seems to be um, absent or at lower levels in healthy colonies. Uh, but very high levels in the sick colonies. Uh, and there doesn't even seem to be one combination of those different disease agents. But overall, sick colonies, this may surprise you, have more diseases than not sick colonies. That's kind of a take home message from this. But again, it's not very consistent as to what individual disease or combination of diseases. So there seems to be very complex webs of the pathogens that the bees are dealing with. Now whether this is cause or effect is still unknown. Are the collapsed colonies dying because they're just overwhelmed with too many pathogens? Or are their immune systems being compromised by some other factor which then prompts them to be more sick, right? So this association seems to be upheld and very repeatable and found by multiple groups but again, it's an association that we don't know if it's in a cause or an effect at this point. So uh, the, that longitude, all of those studies um, were looking at that single cross-section in time, uh, but the, the longitudinal study of looking at the same colonies repeatedly over the course of the year, um, that came out in, um, in this paper and uh, subsequent papers looking at the different sampling events and the different uh, causes or the, di the different um, experiences that these operations had over the course of the season. And one of the uh, interesting um, findings from that series of studies was looking at how the queens and how well mated they were at the beginning of the study, how that predicted the longevity of the colonies over the course of that year. Sue did a really great job earlier this morning talking about the importance of genetic diversity <coughs> within colonies. Um, and what this showed is that by measuring the mating numbers of the queens at the beginning of this year, ranging from you know, three or four matings all the way up to about 35 matings by the queen. And then looking at the colony survival and whether the colonies survived or not. Um, and so just to make this graph, graphic a little, little bit more simplistic, when we look at colonies where the queens were mated with fewer drones, that is the worker force was less diverse with seven or fewer matings, those colonies were three times more likely to die at the end of the season than colonies where their queens mated sufficiently or more than seven times. So the colonies that lived, they tended to be much more diverse. The colonies that died, they tended to be the ones that were much less diverse and that their queens were inadequately mated. So this really showed how the underlying genetics and genetic diversity within the colonies had a profound effect on the overall survivorship um, and the onset of colony collapse disorder in these migratory operations. Again, it's, not, it's an association, it's not a cause, but it's an underlying contributor of uh, bee ill health within the colonies. So the way that things stand now, and again, there's been lots of other research, 
um, subsequently by other groups uh, dealing with colony collapse disorder, and this was really just derived from those early studies uh, 10 years ago when CCD was first described. Uh, but I think by and large the conventional wisdom from the American perspective is that colony collapse disorder is a syndrome that is a combination of all of these different stressors that's uh, going about in the environment. And more importantly, why it's been very difficult to kind of tie all of these things together is that in some cases, colony collapse can occur by one major factor, say viruses, in combination with other things like pesticides or varroa mites. But then in other instances, you can have a combination of entirely different factors that can result in the same syndrome. And so that's what's made it very difficult to try and piece all of this together, is that the lack of consistency arriving at the same end um, makes it incredibly hard to, to make one underlying cause or even combination of causes. Now since then, of course, there's been a lot of other investment. There was uh, an entire uh, coordinated agricultural project completely devoted to trying to understand the underlying causes of colony collapse disorder. The Bee Informed Partnership has been uh, very important in understanding what management practices beekeepers have been doing that results in success versus failure and trying to learn as a community among all the different beekeepers of what's working and what's not so that we can try to better our management practices and get to the bottom of not just colony collapse disorder in the strict sense, but all of the problems that we've been facing, both known and unknown causes. So as an example from the Bee Informed Partnership, this is completely washed out, my apologies, but um, just believe everything I say from now on. <laughs> the, um, these series of, of surveys that have been going on over time as part of the Bee Informed Partnership um, if you could read that column at all, you would see that colony collapse disorder is way down here at the bottom. That these are the top reasons that beekeepers have been answering in their surveys in the U.S. as to why their colonies died. And colony collapse disorder, I should say, symptoms consistent with colony collapse disorder are uh, very, very low in the ranking. The top rank things are starvation, whether the colonies were weak going into winter, um, queen problems, weather, all of these things that are not CCD. Um, and so uh, again, it underscores this whole point that um, CCD is a minority issue compared to all of the other problems that result in colonies dying off. And I think we need and have been taking this kind of global comprehensive approach to try to better be health rather than strictly focusing on CCD itself. Um, these are many of the different funding agencies that helped that, uh, fund that original work uh, 10 years ago, um, and USDA has been very supportive in trying to follow up on that. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I'm sure Can there will be. If you could go back to the slide where you did uh, the mate, where the bees are, the queen is, has a lot of matings and one where she doesn't have a lot of matings, and then um, whether the colony was healthy or not. Yeah. That one or no, this no, the one? other one back. This that one, that one mm -hmm. there, more diverse and less diverse, yeah. Yes. Now I just, uh, I understand the less diverse matings on, on the left-hand side, but on the, more, on the right hand side, more diverse that lived or died, I mean, it seems 50-50 if it lives or dies. I just want to so that's another, uh, it's very insightful. Um, best case scenario, the queens only lived, half of the queens lived for that one year. So this has been a focus of a lot of our research is that, you know, queens are supposed to live two, three years, right? That's what the textbooks say. Um, but in actuality, in these operations, um, half of them didn't even make it that first year. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, this is very problematic. And, you know, we've been trying to look into 
what makes a good queen good and how can we try to bolster queen health because that will go a long way to bolstering colony health. Mating has certainly something to do with it, but that's also a very complex issue. But yeah, absolutely. Um, best case scenario, 50-50, which is still not great. Can you tell me, please, has any work been done on the effect of supplementary feeding, amounts, corn syrup, and so on, on the winter mortality of, of bees? Yeah, so very early on, um, there were surveys done among those beekeepers that experienced colony collapse disorder, trying to look at different factors, like what queen stock were you using? What were you feeding? Were you using antibiotics or not? And a lot of those types of questions that were done. And there didn't seem to be any consistency when it came to nutrition, um, as far as supplemental nutrition. Uh, but I think that that, um, still needs to be explored, and uh, there has been work done on that, but not in the strict sense of CCD, right? Uh, more to overall bee health. So um, how that plays into it doesn't seem to be, again, a direct <laughs> cause, that colonies that died of CCD were all fed high fructose corn syrup, and colonies that don't aren't, right? So it's not that simple, but how it plays into some of these other factors uh, needs to be teased out. You appear to have focused your research on the big bee farmers. Mm -hmm. Is CCD problem similar in the small hobbyists? Great question. Next question. No. Um, <laughs> that, uh, so the reason that this was done, again, because in North America, the vast majority of the pollination services that's done to greater agriculture, which is the reason why bees are important, are done by those large-scale commercial beekeepers. Uh, but the Bee Informed Partnership and the surveys not only survey the large commercial beekeepers, but also small-scale hobbyists. Um, and it seems that um, CCD in the strict sense and bee ill health in the general sense are not um, unique to the large-scale commercial beekeepers. That um, both of those, uh, all of the issues are a biological phenomenon that small-scale beekeepers also have, right? Now, th that can get into the weeds very, very quickly, but in general, um, CCD in, in the strict sense and in the general sense is not unique to the large-scale commercial beekeepers. Um, the smaller-scale beekeepers have them as well. But of course, in the United States, where do the hobbyist beekeepers buy their bees from? The large-scale beekeepers, right? So it's, it's hard to tease that apart, but it is definitely not unique to the larger-scale operations. Most of it, as you say, is the commercial keepers. And I've seen on television how they transport the bees, and they're pretty rough. And uh, a lot of it relates to stress. Mm -hmm. So isn't it uh, something to be looked at in relation to uh, that as a factor? Because I know that when bees go out to pollination, they come back in a pretty dire state. Mm -hmm. And so um, when they transport them for so many distances and so forth and treat them roughly, um, I wonder whether that might be a cause. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And in fact, we as a lab in collaboration with some others have been looking at just that. And just earlier this year, we published um, a couple of papers looking at the effects of the migratory stress um, on the, it's really the first long-term physiological study looking at the consequence of movement and, and that migratory movement. Now, Dave Hackenberg and many of the others say, well, we've been doing this for decades, um, and sure, it's been stressful on them, but you know, there's gotta be something different because now they're, they're not doing as well compared to historical, you know, um, when they were doing it 30 years ago. Um, the, what our findings, um, from, from that study, we're, we did cross-fostering experiments of colonies that were moved versus those that were stationary. And the take-home message from that study is that in the springtime, when there's lots of ample forage, being stationary is better than being trucked you know, and being moved. But in the dearth of the summer, being moved into an agricultural area is actually better than being uh, um, stationary in a place that's depauperative forage. So while movement itself can reduce very slightly the longevity of individual workers and be stressful on the bees, uh, 
in the end, it depends on the environment in which they're placed. And um, you know, sometimes agricultural environments can be depauperate or worse, but sometimes they can actually be better. So really it depends on, on where they're placed and less so of the movement that they're experiencing. Has there been any change in the profile of bee health since the Africanized bee moved into the southern states? Has there been, let me just rephrase that question. Here's a giant landmine, please step on it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, man, that's another, that's just a huge thing, is really in many ways completely unaccounted for. R completely. Um, how the underlying genetics affects all of this has got to be huge. The genetic creep of Africanized bees and, you know, the Africanized bee genome being kind of slowly seeping into the breeding population of, of North American bees, really, for the most part, unknown. Um, it's, it's just, it's really hard to tease that apart. It's really hard to tease that apart. So, um, I mean, I know people are aware of it, but they're also, I think, in some ways, burying their head in the sand when it comes to that issue. Is that, would you agree with that, Sue? I think so, yeah. We, as, as geneticists, we just, we'd like to ignore that. <laughs> a, a question related to a previous question um, about rough handling. On mm. one of our TV programs, showed beekeeping um, in the United States and was related to CCD, showed a couple of things which I thought were very questionable practice really. One of them was dosing hives with a material which was being applied in a very unmetered form. Um, basically there was a bucket of a white powder which wasn't explained that it, you've got it. Um, and then the other one was um, packaging bees. Yep. And the approach seemed to be basically um, to knock all the bees out of as many hives as you got, put them into one huge amorphous mass um, get a bucket and, and scoop them out and then pour them into a package, add a queen that came from somewhere yep. um, and, and put the lid on it and then flog it as a colony of bees where mm -hmm. it struck me it was really just a box of bees. It didn't have any colony structure at all. They were just Correct. random bees in a box. Um, any thoughts on that? Many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I personally have been espousing to... Uh, population of beekeepers in North Carolina, which are 99 plus percent hobbyist beekeepers, to get off of that package treadmill. I think there's a place for those packages and kind of this instant start of, of a colony, but as you said, it's not really a colony. It's um, bees thrown together so that they can start a colony. And there are pros and cons to doing it that way. And I think it works fairly well on a large scale, large scale beekeepers. But I've, I've really been um, pushing having locally sourced nukes, starting with actual colonies, not packages, and locally sourced queens. The bottleneck in that type of approach is raising good high quality queens, as I'm sure Sue will address later on this afternoon. Is that your talk this afternoon? Um, and so, you know, so that's the real bottleneck. Um, and so it's easier said than done uh, but that is traditionally, um, again, because of this north-south dynamic of large-scale beekeepers overwintering in the south and then selling packages um, to spring when it starts to beekeepers up north, uh, that's been something that's going on in, in the industry for quite a long time. Yeah. Oh, the white powder? Yeah, I mean, prophylactic use of antibiotics is nothing that um, is espoused. Um, but I think you know a lot of beekeepers do a lot of a lot of things. There's been a lot of uh, mite treatments that were off label for a long time, you know. And these are those are really regulatory issues that you know we don't have any authority over. Uh, but um, biologically, it is not sustainable, and it's something that again we need to uh, get away from. Yeah. I would like to, um, to link starvation with the life cycle seen that you've separated them, but I don't feel they can be separated in this. If you look at pollen, 
it's key, I believe, that worker bees, if they don't get pollen two days after they emerge from the cell, their pharyngeal glands don't develop, and so they can't feed young bees. And I think this is key. Yeah. So I started looking at pollen. Cereal crops, which includes maize and all the others, have very fine pollen. The other sorts of um, crops have larger pollen. Bees will go to larger pollen in preference. They'll only go to the fine pollens when they're desperate. Also, I was talking to people about um, self-fertile crops. In general, not specific crops, but in general, self-fertile crops, which farmers are getting with the lack of bees, but, uh, have less pollen, mm -hmm. even less. So I then worked out that if you, and you've linked a new thing in with this for me today, because you said a lot of these queens are dying after a year. Within a year? Yes. If you have no queen, and you've got to start off a new queen cell and everything, before that queen and the worker bees can feed new baby bees, that takes 50 days my figures are very approximately, but I'm only one or two days out. Mm -hmm. If you've got a flying queen, it takes 28 days mm -hmm. before you've got new worker bees that can feed young bees. So I believe, especially in America where you don't have any um, uh, landfill sites, side of the farms where there's wildfowls, uh, uh, no, let me, re I'm flustered side of the road crops, where there's dips in the, in the cornfields, they don't even put wildflowers in those. Mm -hmm. Where you've got this sort of landscape, I think starvation is imperative because you have to look at the rolling plan of new bees coming along to feed. Mm -hmm. So there might have been some pollen in your colony collapse one, but the new queen, look, she's got young bees with her. It all fits. To me, lack of pollen is the key factor, and I think it ought to be linked in with a rolling plan of the hive. How do you actually do that scientifically? I don't know. Exactly. I mean, can't do it with one bee, but a rolling plan <coughs> and pollen. And I'm sure yeah. if we could just plant up more plants with pollen, it would help. Well, to, to say, to disassociate, I, I mean, that is one of the three key factors, right? So that's exactly, to say it was disassociated is, is not true at all. Um, that we know that that is key, right? That it is, but it's not the, um, the one and only factor, right? It's got to be working in conjunction with some of these other factors, right? So I totally agree with you that... Um, and especially about the queens, right, and, and the, the lack of productivity that a queenless hive has and, you know, all these other problems, which is why we as a lab have been focusing on that. But, you know, nutrition is key to a lot of these different things. And if they don't have the adequate nutrition, then all of these other factors are moot, right? Um, and so, you know, to, I am totally in agreement that that is um, central <laughs> to it and that it really is at a landscape scale that we need to be thinking about this. Um, and in North America, we don't have the hedgerows that you have, but we envy them. And we've been trying to, um, you know, as, as a pollination community, trying to instill farmers to do that. There's a lot of um, programs that the U.S. now has to try to improve hedgerows, um, buffer zones, and improve that kind of planting outside of the normal kind of blooming window. So yeah, you're absolutely right, but that has to be done at a landscape scale um, in order to really be uh, efficacious. One last question before we get like, the doctor comes well out of lunch. Dave, I, th I think you've answered my question, but um, what, uh, what correlation, if any, um, is there between the increase in monoculture incidence in the United States and the increase in incidence of CCD. Man, you guys are just tough, tough room. <laughs> um, that again is it's it's hard to compare because that the consolidation and the the 
increasing scale of monoculture has happened over time. So we don't have a good comparison, right? Side by side comparison. Um, there have been studies that have really looked at uh, floral diversity, especially in the pollen, is much better for bees to be healthy and productive than monofloral pollen, right? So that is clear. So we can extrapolate then that, um, you know, uh, a monoculture in a field is not as good for the bees as, you know, um, a polyfloral, you know, area. Uh, but being able to, to adequately control those things and link that again to CCD in the strict sense has uh, proven very, very challenging. One of the only ways that, uh, to get around that has been doing these surveys and looking, asking beekeepers, you know, wh where, what, what uh, crops were your hives near at that time, right? And comparing those that experienced CCDs versus not. And again, there hasn't been kind of one, oh, the ones that experienced CCD were always near soybeans, right? So there hasn't been anything like that. But again, it's really hard knowing the foraging radius of colonies and, and, the, and the variation that they experience, even the same colonies in the same place at the same time. So um, there hasn't been a, a strong signal with that yet, but that doesn't mean that it's um, absent of, of being part of the equation, for sure. Well, thank you all very much. Enjoy your lunch. Appreciate it. Thank you.